Good evening. This is Orson Welles, your producer of a special series of broadcasts presented by the makers of Tab's Blue Ribbon. The Mercury Summer Theater of the Air. Tonight and every Friday night, present you with a front row seat at one of the greatest plays ever produced. So while Orson Welles entertains you... Well, ladies and gentlemen, tonight we bring you a tale of dark secrets. And of a dark and secret love. An English classic. A standard work, too, in our Mercury repertory. With a special score composed and conducted by that pillar of the Mercury, Mr. Bernard Herman. With your obedient servant as the strange master of Thornfield Hall. And Miss Alice Frost in the title role of Jane Eyre. My name is Jane Eyre. I have no father or mother, brothers or sisters. When I was ten years old, my aunt sent me off to Lowood School. It was not so much a school as an institution for the children of the poor. Soon after I was 18, I placed an advertisement in the Yorkshire Herald, applying for the position of governess. The following week, a reply came from a Mrs. Fairfax of Thornfield Hall in Yorkshire. If J.E., who advertised last Thursday, is qualified to teach the usual branches of a good English education, a situation can be offered her where there is but one pupil, a little girl nine years of age. I left Lowood School, and that evening, I was at Thornfield Hall. How do you do, my dear? Oh, I'm afraid you've had a tedious run. No, indeed, ma'am. Shall I have the pleasure of seeing Miss Fairfax tonight? I am Mrs. Fairfax. Oh, you mean your pupil, Adele. She is not my daughter. The child is Mr. Rochester's ward. And who is he? The owner of Thornfield Hall. I'm merely the housekeeper. Your pupil is his ward. He wrote me to find a governess for her. He's not here himself? Almost never. Much of the time, he's abroad. It does seem strange for a gentleman to own this great house, yet never stop here to enjoy it. You will find Miss Eyre... That Mr. Rochester is in many ways a strange gentleman. I slept smooth and soundly that night in my new home. Once I woke and heard a clock strike. I heard another sound. It seemed to me that somewhere in the house I heard a low, nervous laugh. Then for many weeks, Nothing happened to break the smooth course of our lives at Thornfield Hall. One day in January, I put on my coat and went out for a walk. The afternoon was already dimming. On the hilltop above me sat the rising moon, pale as a cloud. Suddenly, in the distance, I heard the sound of hooves. A horseman came over the hill down toward the little bridge. Easy! Easy there! Oh! The devil! Are you injured, sir? Stand on one side. Oh. Down, pilot! Down! Oh, my leg. You, uh... Where do you come from? You young girl, you're not a servant in the hall. I'm the governess to Mr. Rochester's oh, ward. Oh, you're a governess. Just take it if I haven't forgotten the governess. Well, 
Necessity compels me to make you useful. Come closer, me lean on your shoulder. Now hold the bridle. Here we are. Now just hand me my whip, which lies there under the hedge. Yes, sir. Thank you. Goodbye, child. Enveloped in a riding cloak, fur collared and steel clasped, remembering his stern face, his angry, thwarted eyes. It was late when I got back to the hall. This is Fairfax. What dog is that? He came with the master. With whom? With the master, Mr. Rochester. He had an accident. His horse fell coming down Hay Lane. He said you were to go to him the minute you came in. Oh. You'd better hurry. Come in. Well, don't sit down, Miss Hale. You've been resident in my house three months. Yes, sir. You come from... From Lowood School, sir. Hmm. Charitable concern. How long were you there? Eight years. Eight years? You must be tenacious of life. No wonder you have rather the look of another world. I marveled where you got that sort of faith. And half a mind is now in Hay Lane to demand whether you'd bewitched my horse. Indeed, I'm not sure yet. Who are your parents? I have none. Or ever had, I suppose. Now, don't draw that chair further off, Miss Ayer. Sit down exactly where I placed it. If you please. Otherwise, I cannot see you without disturbing my comfortable position, which I have no mind to do. You examine me, Miss Eyre. You think me handsome? No, sir. Hmm. And what fault do you find with me, pray? Does my forehead not please you? Does it look as if I were a fool? Why don't you answer me? You look very much puzzled, Miss Eyre. You are not pretty any more than I am handsome. The puzzled air becomes you, so... Puzzle on. I leave the choice of subjects entirely to you. You're dumb, Miss Eyre. Or oh, oh, stubborn. Yes, stubborn. A little annoyed. Confess it, you're afraid of me. I'm bewildered. You're afraid. I have no wish to talk nonsense. If you did talk nonsense, it would be in such a grave, quiet man, I should mistake it for sin. <laughs> you never laugh, Miss Eyre. Don't trouble to answer. It's past nine, sir. I must say good night. Good night. Good night, Miss Eyre. I could not sleep for thinking of Mr. Rochester. I lay there listening. as if fingers were groping their way along the panels in the dark gallery outside. Who's there? What is it? There was a strong smell of burning. Mr. Rochester's door was ajar, and smoke rushed from his room. The curtains were on fire. Wait! Wait, Mr. Rochester, wait! Yeah? Huh? He lay stupefied in his sleep. I rushed to the basin of pitcher. Go! Oh. What is it? Is there a flood? No, sir, but there's been a fire. In the name of all the elves in Christendom, is that Jane Eyre? What have you done with me, witch? Sorceress? <clears throat> the smoke. Who's in this room besides you? Look at me, Jane. Did you... Did you happen to hear... during the night an odd laugh? Yes, sir. I thought perhaps one of the servants... Just so, one of the servants. You guessed it. Jane, you're no talking fool. Say nothing about it. What? Are you quitting me already and in that way? You said I might go, sir. But not without taking leave, not in that brief, dry fashion. <laughs> you saved my life, at least. Shake hands. You saved my life, Jane. I knew you'd do me some good in some way. Sometime. Then, Mr. Rochester, left Thornfield Hall. And when he returned, 
It was with a large company of very elegant guests. There was one lady in particular to whom my master seemed especially attentive. The Honorable Blanche Ingram. Lord Ingram's sister she is. She's held the most beautiful girl in the county. And this beautiful and accomplished young lady is not yet married? It appears not. What is the matter with you, child? You've eaten nothing. What is it, Jane? What's happened to you? That evening, word came that Mr. Rochester wished to introduce my pupil, Adele, to the ladies in the drawing room after dinner. I rose and curtsied to them. One or two bent their heads in return. The others only stared at me. As soon as I could, I left quietly through the side door. How do you do? I'm very well, sir. Why did you not come over and speak to me in the drawing room, Jane? I did not wish to disturb you. What have you been doing while I was away? Teaching Adele, as usual. Oh. Getting a good deal paler than you were. Now, who in the devil is that at this time of night? Shall I go and see Yes, her? Jane, I must return to my guests. I fear Miss Ingram will have marked my absence. Mr. Watson? Yes? There's a man to see you, sir. He, he went into the drawing room. Devil he did. Have you his name? Mason, sir, and he's come from the West Indies. Mason? From Jamaica, I think. Oh, I'll see him presently. Yes, Mr. Rochester. Mason, West Indies. Is that what she said? Do you feel ill, sir? Oh, Jane. Jane. I've got a blow. I've got a blow, Jane. If all the people in that drawing room came in a body and spat at me, what would you do, Jane? I'd turn them out of the room, sir. If I could. But if I were to go into them and they dropped off and left me one by one, what then? Would you go with them? I rather think not, sir. I should have more pleasure in staying with you. To comfort me? Yes, sir. To comfort you as well as I could. that night. I wakened suddenly. Jane, Jane, get up. Get up, I need you. Have your sponge in your room. Yes, sir. You won't turn sick, Jane, at the sight of blood. Here, give me your hand. Let me see. Warm and steady. You'll do, Jane. Come along. I followed Mr. Rochester to the floor above. We entered a large room. And beyond that, there was an open door. And from inside came a low sound. Almost like a dog growling. In a chair was a form of a man, huddled and still. I saw that it was a stranger, Mason. The gentleman who had called earlier. His sleeve and his shirt on one side was soaked with blood. She's done for me. Quiet, Miss. Done for me. Nonsense, you've lost a little blood, that's all. Now then, Jane. Hold this basin. Oh, she went at me with her teeth. Will she, you be silent? She sucked the blood. She said she'd drain my heart. I warned you, Mason. I thought I could have done her some you good. You thought you thought, Mason. Get up. You must be out of the house before morning. <laughs> Let her be taken care of. Let her be treated as tenderly as may be. Let now her I be... I do my best, Mason. And have done my best. And will do it. Never fear. Yet. Would to God... There was an end to all this. You are listening, ladies and gentlemen, to the Mercury Theatre's radio production of the great English classic, Jane Eyre. Splendid, splendid, Pat's Blue Ribbon. And now Orson Welles continues with Jane Eyre. Mr. 
Rochester stayed on at Fernfield Hall. The talk continued about his coming marriage to Miss Ingram. Yet never had he called me more frequently to his presence. Never had he been kinder to me. And alas, never had I loved him so well. It was a midsummer eve. I went down into the orchard. I heard a nightingale singing in the woods far away. Jane? Good evening, Jane. Thornfield is a pleasant place in summer, is it not? Yes, sir. <laughs> You'd be sorry to leave. Oh, yes. Pity, it's always the way in this life. No sooner have you got settled in a pleasant resting place than a voice calls to you to rise and move on. Must I move on, sir? Must I leave Thornfield? I believe you must, Jane. I'm sorry, Jane, but I believe indeed you must. You're going to be married, sir. Uh, look at me, Jane. You're not turning your head to look after more nightingales, are you? Aunt Dale must go to school, and you, Miss Eyre, will get a new station. Yes, sir. I will advertise and eat I've heard of a place that I think will suit a place in Connex, Ireland. That's a long way off, sir. A long way off from what, Jane? Oh, from England, from Thornfield, and... Well? From you, sir. Oh, it is. It is, to be sure, it is. Long way off. We've been good friends, Jane, have we not? Come, we'll sit here in peace tonight. We should never more sit here together. You know, sometimes I have a queer feeling with regard to you, Jane. Especially when you're near to me, as now. It's as if I had a string somewhere under my left ribs tightly and inextricably knotted to a similar string situated on the corresponding corner of your little frame. And if that boisterous channel come broad between us, I'm afraid that cord of communion will be snapped. And then, I have a nervous notion I should take to bleeding inwardly. As for you, you'd forget me. Now, Jane... I think you'd better stay. Do you think I can stay to become nothing to you? Do you think because I'm poor, obscure, plain, and little, that I'm soulless and heartless? I have as much soul as you, and full as much heart. Jane, be still. I offer you my hand, my heart, and a share of all my possessions. Don't mock me. I ask you to pass through life at my side to be my wife. It's you only I intend to marry. Come, Jane. Come here. Your bride stands between us. My bride is here. You strange. You almost unearthly thing. I love you as my own flesh. Come to me, Jane. Come to me entirely now. God pardon me. And men, meddle not with me. I have her and will hold her. Otherwise, then God's word doth allow, are not joined together by God, neither is their matrimony lawful. Edward Rochester, wilt thou have this woman for thy wedded wife? This marriage cannot go on. I declare the existence of an impediment. Proceed to the service. Mr. Rochester has a wedded wife, now living at Thornfield Hall. I saw her there last April. I am her brother. What this man here says is true. Bigamy is an ugly word, yes. That is what I meant to be. A bigamist. I dare say you've heard gossip about the mysterious lunatic 
kept under watch and ward. I now inform you that she is my wife, Bertha Mason, whom I married 15 years ago in Spanish on Jamaica. Bertha Mason is insane. You may see for yourself, if you wish, what sort of being I was cheated into marrying. And judge whether or not I had a right to break the compact and seek happiness with this girl I love. Well, I fail. Take the coach back to Thornfield. Not be wanted today. To the right about every one of you. Away with your congratulations. Who wants them? They're 15 years too late. Next morning at dawn, I made my possessions into a parcel and stole from my room. For the last time, I passed Mr. Rochester's door started down the dark stairs. Jane? Jane? You mean to go one way in the world and let me go another? I do. You will not stay, Jane? You will not be my comforter, my rescuer? My deep love, my... my tragic grief? They're nothing to you? God bless you, my dear master. God keep you from harm and wrong. Jane. 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 A year and a half went by. I wrote to Mrs. Fairfax and begged for news. Three months wore away. Day after day, the post arrived and brought nothing for me. I packed my things and took the stagecoach for the north. Thirty-six hours later, I was at Milk. Come a wrong way today, Mum. We don't get many travelers here these days. I thought perhaps you could tell me. Is Mr. Rochester living at Thornfield Hall now? Well, I say, Mum, don't you know? Thornfield Hall was burned down. Oh. Not a stone standing. The fire broke out in the dead of night. The dead of night? Was it known how it started? They guessed, Mum. They guessed. There was a woman. Would you believe it? A lunatic. But Mr. Rochester, was he at home when the fire broke out? Yes, indeed he were. He went up to the tower to get his mad wife out of her cell. She was on the roof. We heard him call her name. We saw him approach her. And then, Mum, she yelled and gave a spring, and the next minute she lay smashed on the pavement. Dead? Yes. Dead as the stones on which her brain and blood were scattered. Oh. But is, is he alive? Yes, yes. Mr. Rochester is alive. But many think he'd better be dead. Why? Where is he? Is he in England? Aye, aye, he's in England. He can't get out of England. I fancy he's a fixture now. He's stone blind. Yes, he's stone blind, is Mr. Rochester. I found him in a small manor house nearby. A neglected handful of fire burned low in the grate. And leaning over it with his head supported against the high, old-fashioned mantelpiece, stood Mr. Rochester. Is that you, Mrs. Fairfax? Down, pilot. What's the matter? Down, sir. It is you, Mrs. Fairfax, is it not? Mrs. Fairfax is in the kitchen. Who is this? Answer me. Speak again. Your dog knows me. John and Miss Fairfax. Her very fingers. Her small, slight fingers. If so, there must be more of her. Is it Jane? This is her shape. This is her size. And this is her voice. And her heart, too. Jane Eyre. Jane Eyre. I've now been married ten years. I know what it is to live entirely for and with what I love best on earth. Edward Rochester continued blind the first two years of our marriage. 
Then one morning, as I was writing a letter for him to his dictation, he came and bent over me. Jane. Jane, have you a glittering ornament around your neck? Yes. And, Jane, are you wearing a, a pale blue dress? Yes. Later, when our firstborn was put into his arms, he could see that the boy had inherited his own eyes as they once were, laughing, brilliant, and black. Orson Welles will be back in just a few seconds to tell you about next week's production of the Mercury Summer Theater. Now, Mr. Wells. Next week, ladies and gentlemen, we bring you one of the most fascinating stories that it's ever been the privilege of the Mercury Theater to broadcast. One of the very tallest of all the tall stories ever told. It's a yarn of high adventure on the high seas. It's called The Passenger to Bali. Till then, till next week then, at the same time, same stations, and for everybody in the Mercury Theater, I remain, as always, obedient for yours. Columbia Broadcasting System.